Australia, well, I'm from across the ditch. Um, I have come to this country and am staying in this country for a while now because it is the most exciting place to be as a person wanting to work in um, transformation of government um, for the better. So um, I, what we've done in this experiment is we wanted to explore what the future of government service delivery might look like, feel like, you know, um, be like um, when we start looking at um, a couple of specific assumptions. So, Really at the core of this is, um, well I'll start with who we are, so who are we? <laughs> We've got a core team of around a dozen people and I'm going to get to the thank yous uh, at the end of all this, but almost all are actually part time. In fact there's only one person, me, that's actually been full time on this. So all of this has been done with um, part time people across uh, multiple agencies, across multiple companies, and um, it's been led by the DIA Service Innovation Team, but there's been support from multiple areas across the DIA, multiple areas across um, departments. So there's been a lot of people that have contributed in some way, shape, or form to this, and um, and it, it wouldn't be as, as amazing as it was if it wasn't for those people. Um, and then of course uh, the other element to this, which has been a little bit new for some people to get used to, is uh, rabid, open transparency about everything we do. Making sure that we publish everything is not a matter of fun. It's not a matter of being nice. It's about um, taking a scientific approach to the design and delivery of government. If we uh, push out the information, if we push out our outcomes, our discoveries, our um, hypotheses, our um, outputs, it gives us a chance to um, test and validate with people, for people to say actually there's a better way of doing this. And the amount of goodwill that it's created, but also people willing to come and share their perspective and actually improve the outcome is amazing. So a lot of that draws, I guess, from um, um, a, a few of our experiences in the open source community. And um, I think that, that methodology of open source and, and science and peer review has uh, been a critical part of this and it will continue to be so moving forward. So through the work we've discovered, um, I guess, four systemic challenges um, and, um, and why this is relevant is because this, um, even though it's been discovered through the process of the last couple of months, it ended up becoming a, a fascinating way of looking at the challenge that we all have in government. So the first one is there's few tangible or published examples of what good looks like, particularly relating to integrated services. Everyone has a different perspective. Everyone has a different view, different lens that they bring to it. And when you actually get in the room and try to design or implement something, quite often that, um, that disconnect or different approaches gets in the way. So one of the things we wanted to achieve out of this work to explore what good could look like, not what it does look like, but some ideas about what it could look like well into the future. Again, usually, um, so iteration has become an appealing way to improve the status quo, but it runs the risk of reinforcing the status quo. <laughs> um, so what it, we wanted to do was ignore the status quo, ignore the technical environment, the legislative environment, ignore all of it and actually take a, a user-centered design approach to the nth degree where we looked purely through the lens of the user and designed uh, a future state that could be private sector or public sector or community sector. Even more interestingly, it could be all of them. Um, the idea that um, people's needs can, um, we, we should be able to design our way towards a future rather than just limit ourselves to the constraints of the present. The third major systemic uh, constraint is that, um, as we've seen internationally and to some degree locally, when agile and user-centered design methods have been adopted, they're all often constrained. They're constrained to the agency view, to the mandate, to the legacy um, technology limitations and other things. And finally, this concept of government is, is often assumed to be the, the role of sole provider. This is a big um, systemic challenge if we're looking into the future because government will only ever be able to do so much for so many people. Um, it can't be everything to everyone and yet the, um, the, the, there is an increasing complexity and diversity of the needs of the communities that we um, provide for, that we support. So the idea of actually opening up government components so that government provides the service, a service but then opens it up for the private sector, community sector, and even citizens themselves to be able to innovate and to be able to get that serendipitous innovation that's enabled when you actually have open access. So we started from a hypothesis, or a couple of hypotheses as it turned out. But this has been a, a, a reasonably scientific, as much as you can in this kind of space, approach. So because this has been about experimentation, testing assumptions, testing concepts, um, the key one was does government as a platform provide a practical path to the future state of government services? Does it, um, a, a secondary part of that is, does it actually help us ch um, tackle some of those um, systemic challenges that have been identified? And the secondary uh, hypothesis is, can the neutral permissive environment of a service innovation lab support service delivery teams to build better things? So it wasn't just about providing a lab and people coming and using it and watching. That was one part of the experiment. 
our team was about being a team, uh, being a, 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 a team of um, service deliverers <laughs> in actually designing and trying to implement and seeing how that would work and what, what is actually needed to support that across the system. So, I guess the key, the first part, we uh, discovered design and test with real people, trademark. Um, the, this concept of gathering all the existing user research we could across government. Now, in a lot of cases, that was the very well-connected other members of, of the team drawing on every favour they had to find you know, all the user research they could. In some cases, it was informally given. In some cases, it was, in almost no cases, it was formally given. But access to that research as it already exists across government has been a critical part of looking at what's been done. So we did insights and user needs across that. We then conducted independent user research specifically so that we could test um, if, we, if we took the no agency lens or not even, and even a no government lens, did it result in any change? And then we could actually you know, check that back and validate it. Um, we discovered, um, I guess, uh, some informed, we discovered and designed some informed future state concepts, which was purely driven around the user needs. And finally, all these concepts were tested with users and we came up with insights and validations. So the analysis was done across the team. We had um, um, major support from um, Assurity and from Creative HQ on that. And um, all of that user research is in the process of being published. Obviously, none of the um, personal information, as you would expect, but um, all of the insights uh, will we, we will be publishing um, that we have created. So everything that we're able to publish. And um, at some point in life, if you're lucky, you get to design the way in which things evolve. I think, um, I don't know why Daniel Day-Lewis said that <laughs> quote, but um, I just thought it was a, a lovely um, idea of, of the, the mentality we brought to this. I'm about to show you what those future state concepts were, but I just want to be clear about a couple of things. Because I've already had a couple of teams call up and say, why did you build our service? It's like, no, 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 no. The three concepts that came out were almost modes of delivery. So we haven't built an MSD project. We haven't built a rates rebate service. We haven't built an Auckland Council service. We haven't built a bank service. What we did was we identified three concepts and then fr that came from the user research and then from all of the different things that users were trying to do, <laughs> from their needs, we identified a couple of, I guess, juicy examples that would show and help us test those concepts. So just to be clear, that's what this is. So um, the first future state was conversational. So the conversational one was really about um, real-time resolution, uh, third parties being drawn in um, as required, with user permission, of course, and having a persistent and accessible record of what was going on. So I'm going to jump between a little bit of things. So the user research, this report will be available on Monday. We're just getting the rest of the um, outcomes from that. But there's a lot of good insights. And we're putting up some um, early uh, insights, just the executive summary effectively today. Um, the conversational one, I won't play the sound because it's my voice. Um, and there is a little bit of Star Wars. Um, my apologies. Um, <coughs> In this example, a person's turned 65 since last logging onto their online banking. They get a new notification about not being eligible for NZ Super, and the user has a chance to explore the matter and get it resolved through a transparent multi-agency conversation. The conversation can also be sparked through the person initiating the transaction. <coughs> so in this case, I don't know how well you can see that, but the person, um, since they last on, logged on, they turn 65. So they log on and they get a, we've noticed you've turned 65, happy birthday, by the way, you're not eligible for Super. And the person goes, hold on a second, why is that? And it says, um, oh, you're not eligible because you haven't been in New Zealand for five years or more since turning 50. And the person says, well, that's <coughs> not true. I want to resolve this matter, actually. So they click into effectively a conversational style. They have the, they're asked, you know, how can I help? And they're saying, you know what, um, it's saying I'm not eligible for this reason, but actually I have been here. And they say, oh, you know, um, how can you help us um, prove that? And in this particular case, they say, oh, well, I'll, I'll upload the, the record from my passport. Keep in mind that you wouldn't necessarily need any uploading, you know, all those traditional ideas of copying and pasting stuff around. But the concept of then being able to say, um, well, do you mind if I actually validate that you've been in the country for, for uh, five years since you were 50 with IRD? Uh, no, sorry, with immigration. Immigration joins the conversation with permission from the user. And they get to say, yep, no, we can validate that. That's fine. The service then gets effectively updated, the status, your eligibility criteria, and now it's resolved. So conversational, you can see there's a lot going on there. <laughs> But um, there's a whole bunch of concepts, and then we took a lot of A-B testing with all of these future states to test with our users. The second future state concept is um, proactive service delivery. So the idea that you would have some form of opt-in categories of services that a person could be advised of indirectly or directly through third parties um, with um, some form of seamless follow-through. So uh, that one, we experimented with a few different concepts. One of them was 
the idea that a, a senior, because the, the concept of becoming a senior ended up becoming the lens that we did all of this work through because it was such a good cross-agency, cross-life event, cross-private um, sector, public sector um, example. One of the proactive ones we had was the idea that you've, uh, you effectively get a notification that you're now eligible for free travel and then you go onto the bus and it just works from your phone or your credit card or whatever. So one was automatically pushing and just doing it. Um, this one was a little bit more um, asking for your permission to sort of um, to enable it. So this, in this case, you get a notification from Auckland City Council. They say, hi, we've noticed now that you're eligible for the rates rebate. Um, are you happy for us to authorise your in uh, that your income meets the eligibility test with IRD? So there's a permission there. There's no copying and pasting of content. There's no here's how much I earn or having to provide that. There's a validation going back to a trusted entity who's the authoritative source of that information for government. Person says yes, application gets applied, you get a win for the council, a win for the person, and a win for federal government, of central government. So there's some interesting, again, concepts in that. Some of you by now will uh, uh, you know, quite clearly be thinking, well, that's all fine, but um, you know, this is all make-believe. The whole point here is that we get to reverse engineer these and say, what would actually enable these kinds of future states? And then based on user testing, based on engaging with industry, based on understanding the composite view of services delivery across some of these um, areas, we can identify key areas to invest in experimentation in this and see how it works. So our third future state model is about help me plan. For a lot of things in life, it can't be proactively de um, delivered, or if it is, it's super creepy. <laughs> Um, for a lot of things, it's not, you're not ready to actually transact yet. You actually want to, you know, in government speak, transact. You want to discover, you want to plan, you want to think about what you're doing in five years. We had a lot of our um, 55 to 70 year olds hadn't even started on that journey. They just wanted to understand what the choices were, what the ramifications were, um, how they could make choices over the years leading up to their retirement. So the idea of discovery of information and services through self-selected context, current or future, to plan one's life and then engage with government once comfortable or prepared. This is taking a more dynamic approach than, I guess, uh, what we've traditionally taken in government. But of course, there are excellent examples of this already. Smart Start and NZ Ready are excellent examples of, um, of this kind of concept. We took it a little bit further. Um, we took all of the business rules, and we worked very closely with um, Becky from MSD. A huge thank you to Becky. And what we ended up doing was being able to come up with a demonstrator of the idea of what if we could actually make the business rules code? What if we could actually identify what all of those uh, conditions were that go then across different um, rules, across different agencies, across different services, and then you can start to do some very clever things. So the clever demonstrator of this, and this is a very simple demonstrator, and please don't get caught up with the, um, the colours of those sort of things, but the functionality here is fascinating. So if I'm a person who's, um, let's say I'm a 55-year-old moving to New Zealand because my daughter's about to have a child and I need to become the primary carer. Okay. So I'm interested in immigration, retirement and health because I'm getting older. Am I a citizen or resident of New Zealand? I'm going to say yes for the sake of this. I'm going to just say yes and no to a whole bunch of stuff just to show you the idea of have you completed a needs assessment. I don't actually remember. I can probably validate that with the source agency. Okay, so this is just pretending but that's fine. Um, and then it answers it off it goes. Am I 65 or older? You're not going to necessarily see this straight away but a lot of the things down the bottom here three or four requirements met, um, two of three requirements met and I'm not eligible for this one. I am eligible for this one. Um, so the disability, I'm going to very quickly run through this as fast as I can. It's almost uh, just so you can see where it goes. Dun, 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 dun. And what you end up seeing is the list of things that are available to you down the bottom is obviously responding to the questions. And obviously, you'd need to be fairly smart about these questions to make it as streamlined as possible. And this is just a demo. But let's show you where it went. Almost there. There we go. Almost there. OK. The gra our users didn't really mind if they were or weren't eligible, but they hated the fact they had no transparency. What am I not eligible for and why? If I am eligible for something, why? They, they really wanted that information and to be able to understand what's going on. So being able to go and say, look, grandparent or grandparent visa, um, seven of eight requirements are met. Oh, which one's not met? Um, applicant sponsor is a relative. Yeah, actually I'm the, uh, you know, maybe I'm not a relative. Um, and so they can't change the one. But maybe if, for instance, it was an um, applicant um, is, intends to meet visa conditions, they might say, oh, I didn't know that was a condition. Okay, I'm going to choose now to, to actually change my um, um, planning around that and that way I will actually be eligible for it. So 
this is um, kind of powerful and then a person could you know, go look at their answers and say, okay, here's all the answers. Maybe if I say yes, no and change a few around, it'll probably change the sort of answers that I'm getting. Okay, great. Um, and then the idea of being able to say, okay, at some point I want to apply. Oh, I'm not eligible for this one, so, um, but I should be, so I'm going to go and fix it. And again, you could, you could see how these three modes of service delivery could actually blend into each other. And in a couple of weeks' time, we will have a beautiful future state example for you based on an actual service that does blend the three together in a really meaningful way. So that'll be coming soon. Um, so these three concepts, quite big, quite chunky, quite interesting. Um, and the idea of making those business rules available has such wide-ranging possible applications, not just for service delivery, but also for um, a bunch of other um, needs such as regulation or compliance. So, of course, then we went and reverse engineered the future states. We've put up a blog post with our first stab at trying to reverse engineer that. We had a, a combination of people from um, different sort of backgrounds, different experts, to be able to take that you know, first go at it. And, um, and it was really interesting because, of course, everyone came from a different perspective. And then we ha sort of debated it out a little bit. And even though it was a small group, it was a good start. And we've already had a lot of people online saying, you know, starting to give us a little bit more contributions to that. But you could, you could imagine saying, okay, well, if we've identified that this thing is a core component that we know is needed for all of these things, maybe we could build a first prototype of it, see how it would actually support a service delivery team or a few, see how it could be reused by the third parties, um, and then move on from there. So our tech lead um, from GCIO drove that. Reusable components. Identifying from this, of course, you can start to identify a reusable <coughs> component. Now, a really simple one that we talk about a lot is um, the concept of a services register. What are all the human services across government? What are their conditions? What are their attributes? What of, um, what are, you know, um, not only what they are, but what's the information about them? So one of the things we did was we worked again with MSD to take their family services directory and just create a machine readable version of the exact thing that they already have on data.gov.nz. And the machine readable one just means you can now talk to it via an API. It's only a JSON API. It's not a spatial one in this case, but it's an interesting start because then we got to go and make some, um, do some interesting stuff with it. We took um, all of the DIA registers we had access to and, and built a first version prototype, completely experimental. None of this is real um, in the formal sense of the word, but just being able to see what all of the services were. And when you have machine readable access to information like this that's reconsumable, you can start to do some clever things. So this is literally about half an hour of playtime just to see what you, know, you could do with it from a data visualization perspective, but we've already got three life events wanting to use it and two external organizations wanting to use it and then we haven't even really been talking about it yet. But being able to say, well, what are all the ser central services by agency and which agency is providing all the services? Being able to say, well, I want to look at payments by agency you know, and as you would expect, um, there's a lot with the Ministry of Social Development. Um, but uh, you know, being able to see some of this information about where the payments are is um, a good way of understanding what's going on. And then finally, just as a simple one, again, because we were looking at seniors, just understanding which services were relevant to seniors helps us then be able to present that information appropriately. Okay, so um, <coughs> reusable components. So a services register has become a fairly obvious thing that needs to be built, but there's no natural home for it right now. So that's one of the things we'll be experimenting with next. Uh, we went looking for what good looks like that's already been done. And we found some great stuff. We actually found some amazing examples of good already, but they're either not known or, or um, they're, well, they're just not known or not published. So um, obviously NZ Ready and Smart Start were good examples from a help me plan angle. But we ha um, have also written, it's almost finished, um, a case study on Smart Start from a technical perspective. Their lessons learned from a business perspective paper is amazing and well worth reading. Um, but as we dug below the, you know, as we opened up the hood and sort of in, you know, inspected the engine, we found it was a lot closer to integrated services design than we expected. It was actually quite um, remarkable what's been done there. So we're working with the Smart Start team and with Catalyst IT to draw out some of those technical lessons learned and to look at that. We've also written a quite um, amazing case study uh, by on my MSD, not just my MSD, on the digital transformation journey of MSD. And there's some, again, great lessons learned in there, great examples of good, but also good examples of where it needs to go next. One of the dangers is if you see something better than what you have and assume it to be sufficient, then you miss the opportunity of leapfrogging. So there's some good opportunities there. Oh, and I love this quote for this particular thing. Remember diamonds are created under pressure. So hold on, it'll be your time to shine soon. I think that's fairly, fairly useful. Who wants to play? So again, going back to um, Daryl's comment, 
there's a lot of assumptions around the idea that third parties would want to build on the top of government, and we wanted to just dip our toe in the, in the water of that assumption. So we ran a small 60-person uh, uh, community and industry sector workshop around their user needs for Gov as a platform. And it was fascinating. We got some um, quite remarkable outcomes. They built a lot of um, stuff. They came out with a lot of uh, core components that were useful. They came out with their um, business value, with their barriers, with their user needs. And that's now been written up and it's just been put online a couple of days ago. And so that worked um, extremely well. It, we went in genuinely with the idea that maybe this is not of interest. Maybe it is. You know, let's actually see. And um, the results were quite promising. They were actually very keen. And uh, when we started actually building things, which um, got actually quite fun. Um, we started seeing, uh, no, there we are. And there's a full report available, but we started seeing all kinds of clever things could be built, including online contributions. Um, and the interesting thing about these is that all of them actually have uh, both government components and private sector components. So they started to identify those. And that again, by going and at assessing all of those, we can start to identify what's a common component that if we built, should actually get reused as a test of whether it would actually get reused because it's easy to build Lego, but let's see what happens in the real world. Uh, we're nearly there. Um, innovative agencies. So we had two teams come into the lab um, and they had support from the Lab Plus team and they had support from um, uh, Creative HQ to do a couple of design sprints. Uh, and this was to prototype measurable improvements to two particular services. So um, TEC and IRD came to explore the notion of better choices. And their blog post is almost live. It's just going live uh, right now. Um, but um, some amazing uh, outcomes and, some, and uh, an amazing kudos to them. They wrote a fantastic blog post about their experience, <laughs> about what worked, what didn't work, and what the outcomes were. And they ended up with a, a very shiny um, clickable prototype that actually goes through the concept of a, of a student trying to make better choices. Uh, so there's a video now online up about that and the transcript and everything available. It's w well worth checking out. And, um, and the Smart Start, um, exploring um, Smart Start improve improvements, but also a potential future state for that. That work um, is just being finalized at the moment, and we should be able to publish it hopefully within a couple of weeks. OK, show me the money, OK, the value. The second last thing that we did was got an economist, you know, because it's always good to bring different perspectives into this work, someone who used to work at Treasury to um, assess and to analyze and to explore what the value proposition of this model is. Again, open to the idea it might be zero. He came out with some really interesting ideas from that, and so that'll be written up and we should be able to publish it on Monday. But looking at what the value to the community is, the value to agencies and government, and the value to the private and community sectors. So that um, piece of work is being done, and some fairly interesting metaphors and, and an analogies have come out of that, such as um, we think about physical public infrastructure in a particular way. You know, generally, we do free roads, and then we charge for a road where there's a particular business value. And yet, for digital infrastructure, we tend to charge for everything and only do it free if it's of particular value. And it's interesting, because if you applied the same approach in the digital world that we did in the physical world, it, the entire economy would ground to a halt. So it's um, kind of interesting. And maybe it's the word infrastructure. I don't know. But it's, it's, it's an interesting observation that he's made and some <coughs> modeling around that. So finally, we're contributing to, continuing to contribute to the Service Innovation Toolkit. We're, li we're gathering all our lessons learned, all the tools we've learned, um, used, all the collaboration we've done, and publishing that. And we've captured the lab experience as well. So there's a video coming out um, next week that'll sort of be able to show all of you, the world, uh, what sort of experience we had in there with a couple of special guests uh, giving their perspective as well. So this has been a short, sharp uh, sort of overview of the work. Rather than trying to delve too much into it, because there's a lot there, <laughs> normally with these kinds of fairly experimental initiatives, the way I like to do them is um, get a, an amazing team, um, support and empower and, um, and encourage them to bring their own creativity and ideas to the, uh, to the fore. Um, but to you know, have maybe, don't have everything in one basket or even two baskets. We had nine baskets for this project. I expected a couple to not quite work out, at least. All of them have worked out, surprisingly. It's been amazing. So some of those outcomes are, and there's a lot of reading material there, and there's a lot of um, interesting things to delve into uh, that's worth a lot more than the, the short time we'll be able to do today. The next steps is probably interesting to look at. So the hypotheses that we've looked at have proven reasonably successful. I guess that's the, the first key thing. So the next steps, we're looking at further validation and further research. But taking a, a pragmatic next step, what can we design, build, test? Uh, both in terms of what helps service delivery teams and agencies, what helps private sector and community sectors, and what helps, most importantly, 
um, people, people that actually need to be able to interact with government either directly or indirectly. So this first 10 weeks has been about a small team, diverse backgrounds, testing some concepts. Now that we've done that, now is the time to engage with the broader public service. There wouldn't have been much of a point trying to do that unless you know, the, the outcomes of this have been a little bit promising. But now is the time to figure out how to do that better and we want to work very closely with all of you to do that, to create more of a virtual lab that everyone can drop in and out of as they like so that we're not limited to the physicality of, a, of one or two or however many locations. And we look forward to working with all of you to take this forward. Um, and I think the last thing I'll do is thanks, really. So thanks and acknowledgements. Strength and diversity. I'm sure comms people are going to hate this slide. They always do. I always muck it up. But what I wanted to show you, right, what I wanted to show you is the idea. We had six departments and six companies involved, plus a bunch of people from different backgrounds. And I've purposely not put them in any particular order. I've purposely made them all jumbled up because that's the point. If you get caught up on the traditional approaches of uh, you're doing this for me, um, I want you to do this because I pay you, you know, the traditional kind of procurement approaches work for traditional outcomes. For a non-traditional outcome, you need a different approach. And we've had some good discussions with some of the contractors that have been involved, some of the public servants that have been involved about the experience they've had and just that idea of partnership. We're both trying to do something meaningful. How can we do that genuinely collaboratively? Um, that's been a part of this experiment and a very important part of our success. Uh, so the next part of that, oops, the next part of that, oh, now I've done it. There's a lot of people, so I'm going to make this a bit bigger so it's a bit easier. Um, I'm going to ask everyone that's actually in the room, that's on this list, to please come up, but our core team. So Daryl Carpenter has obviously been the boss. Um, there's been Lead Cat Herder, which is me. And then we've got our core team. We've got people that have come and gone and people that have been involved the whole time. So Michelle, Lee, please come up. I'm going to get very upset if you don't. Michelle, Lee, Tegan, Meredith, Michelle Shannon-Smith, Jean Johnson, Susan, Kate, Bill, Tahir, Jennifer, James, Tinnis, uh, Matt, Felicia Yee, Brooke, Jira, Yasmin. Kind of core team. Then we've got um, eight extra additional agency support and sprint teams. James Collier, Christine Bennett, Murray Johnson, Glenn Thurston, Kate Nixon, Becky Kassam, um, Melanie Turner, Claire Tufexis, Lee Vollens, and then a whole bunch of additional support from private sector and beyond. Rachel Prosser, and Rachel obviously been the head of the lab environment itself, so huge support for us. Uh, Chris Pollard and Ben Heyman, similarly so. Uh, Stefan Korn, Mark Pascal, Jennifer Nickel, Brett Carlton, Phoebe Kwan, um, and Davidson, Yvonne C. And this is going to hide behind this, isn't it? Oh, no. There we go. Kellyanne Hubbard, Derek Moore, Nadine Henderson, Josh Ford. So there's a whole bunch of great people. Uh, and then we have further thanks, of course, we have to. And um, we, we've, we've been given an authority and a permission within our organisation in DIA to do something quite special. And um, a large part of that is because um, Daryl taking a, a big uh, risk and it's, I think, uh, paid off quite well. But we've also obviously had that then support through from uh, Colin McDonald, Maria Robertson and Carl McDiamond, for whom we're very thankful, and a whole bunch of additional people that have just been supporters along the way. So Graham Osborne, Beth Davies, Indiana Ruwiri, Nicola Sandford, Adele Kiddo, uh, Veronica, uh, Victoria Rye, uh, Ray, Victoria's here as well, I'm going to get in trouble. Uh, Carl Stamp, Amy O'Neill, Jonathan Kirk, uh, Catherine Barkham, Rowan Smith and Jason Kiss. And there's probably a couple of others that we haven't included and I, I apologise profusely for whom I've missed. But um, this has been the team, that's the outcomes. Thank you very much for coming and listening. What we're going to do now is stop the recording uh, and take Q&A so that we can all just chat uh, a little bit more informally. But the idea is to take that uh, presentation and put it online so that people can uh, follow along at home as it were. Thank you all very much.